Thank you for joining us in the sunshine state, even though it's liquid sunshine this day. But I promise you the sun will come out. It may not be tomorrow, but it's coming out. And look, those of you who had to spend the night in the, in the airports, we apologize. Hey, the weather service people are here, at least if those in training. You should have warned us <laughs> to be ready. <laughs> Someone said you all did warn us, but we didn't pay attention. <laughs> but that's okay. It is so great to be in person, isn't it? Yeah, let's give a hand. And those of you who are joining us online, welcome. Sorry you're not here at the party. We're here having a good time. And if you could see what I see, beautiful faces, eager to learn and eager to share what they're working on. Welcome to the 10th annual, biannual, NOAA Education and Science Forum. This was supposed to happen almost two and a half years ago, but um, as they say uh, here in Florida, Rona got in the way. You know who Rona is, right? Coronavirus 19. But thank God we are coming out of it and we're moving forward. And we look forward to this day. We have several centers that are represented here. And if I call your center, just give a shout out so those who are on the, on the internet can know that you're here. So if you are part of the NOAA Center for Earth System Sciences and Remote Sensing, can I get a shout out? Thank you. They're here, even though they spent the night in the airport, but they made it. What about NOAA Cooperative Science Center in Atmospheric Sciences and Meteorology led at Howard University? Okay, great, you're here. What about the NOAA Center for Coastal and Marine Ecosystems and Florida Agricultural and Mechanical University, better known as FAMU? <laughs> okay, no, look, this is not the, the last, and they certainly are one of the best. The NOAA Living Marine Resources Cooperative Science Center, uh, led uh, at the university, led by the University of Maryland Eastern Shore. Are you here? All right, welcome. We look forward to this week. We hope that you uh, are ready to learn some new things and share. How many of you have downloaded that app? Because that app is gonna be more accurate, okay? If you need some more instructions on how to use the app, uh, please go to the registration desk. There is a download and a QR code that you can get. And we also have Wi-Fi that's available and we'll be running that slide a little later. If you need to get Wi-Fi and not use up your minutes, we have that available to you as well. So are we ready to get started? Okay, now are we ready to get started? All right, well, I have the pleasure, I have the absolute pleasure of introducing, um, you know, FAMU is known as the Marching 100, right? And the Marching 100, for those of you who don't know, is a world-renowned band, and they have drum majors. And these drum majors do fantastic on the field. But you know what? You always need a drum major in the administration that leads the academic, because that's what we're here for. Isn't that true? So I have the privilege of introducing our drum major. His name is Dr. Larry Robinson. <laughs> Larry Robinson serves as Florida A&M University's 12th president and as a distinguished service professor at the university. Additionally, he is the director and principal investigator of the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, better known as NOAA, the Center for Coastal and Marine Ecosystems, that's CCME. The CCME is a partnership among six universities committed to making major impacts on coastal and marine ecosystems and communities by educating underrepresented minorities, not only educating, but graduating. NOAA relevant science and policy. 
Dr. Robinson is a member of the US Congress Authorized STEM Education Advisory Panel, which was established to provide advice and recommendations to the Committee on Science, Technology, Engineering, and Mathematics Education, better known as CoSTEM, among other responsibilities. Man, you see why he's a drum major? Let me go on. In May 2010, Dr. Robinson took a leave of absence from FAMU to serve in, US, um, in a U.S. Senate confirmed position as Assistant Secretary of Commerce for Conservation and Management at NOAA. While there, he supported NOAA's coastal and marine programs, including marine sanctuaries for preserving areas of special national significance fisheries management, and preparation of nautical charts. He also supported NOAA's participation in addressing the BP oil spill crisis. You all remember that or are you all too young? Okay, well, okay. And served on the Ocean Policy Task Force uh, for the Gulf Coast Restoration Task Force during his tenure. In 2707 to 2009, Dr. Robinson served as a senior scientific advisor at the U.S. Department of Agricultural's Cooperative State Research Education and Extension Services, a mouthful. In 2008, Robinson was selected to serve on the Ocean's Research and Resources Advisory Panel as a member of the National Science Foundation's National Ecological Observatory Network, Science Technology Education Advisory Committee. Dr. Robinson has served as chair of the Council of Academic Vice Presidents for the State of the University of Florida, System of Florida. He chairs the Biology and Medicine Division of the American Nuclear Society and charter member of the National Council for Science and the Environment's Council of Environmental Deans and Directors. Dr. Robinson is a former member of the Board of Trustees of the Florida Chapter of the Nature Conservancy, the National Science Foundation's National Ecological Observatory Network, Education Tiger Team, the International Advisory Board to Florida Center for Research in Science, Technology, Engineering and Mathematics for Leon County, Research and Development Authority. In addition, Dr. Robin has served on numerous scientific advisory boards, including the state of Florida's Aquaculture Interagency Coordinating Committee, External Advisory Board of the Environmental Sciences, Division for Oak Ridge National Laboratory, and many, 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 many others. Dr. Robinson served on the National Research Council Committee on the Restoration of the Greater Everglades Ecosystem the NRC Committee on Mine Placement of Coal Combustion Waste, and the NRC Committee to Review the Florida Aquifer Storage and Recovery Regional Study Technical Report. Dr. Robinson began his career here at FAMU in 1995 as a visiting professor in the Environmental Sciences Institute. He also served as the director of the Institute from 1997 to 2003. He has served the university in numerous capacities, as well as including, he was provost at one time, he was vice president for academic affairs from 2003 to 2005, and again in 2012. He was the chief executive officer and the interim president in 2007. He was the vice president for research in 2009. He also served interim president from 2012 to 2014. And right now he came to us again as president in 2016. So Dr. Robinson served as a research scientist and led a group at Oak Ridge National Laboratory. He was responsible for including trace element analysis and environmental science, uh, forensics, material science, paleontology. His expertise also includes environmental radiochemistry, nuclear safeguards, and non-proliferation. Dr. Robinson attended Lemoyne Owen College. He earned a bachelor's degree in chemistry and graduated summa cum laude from Memphis State University and a doctorate in nuclear chemistry from Washington University at St. Louis, Missouri.
You can see why he's our head drum major, right? He has such an extensive, and I left out half of it. But would you do me a favor and please welcome my boss? You know, I need to get paid. So welcome my boss, Dr. Larry Robinson. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Uh, you are excused after having to listen to all of that, right? I'm, I apologize, but thank you, Dr. Kelly. I, I appreciate it. I, I don't know what to say. You know, normally you don't see people reading your whole bio. <laughs> take, take a piece of it, but thank you, Dr. Kelly. I, you did a great job. I, I really appreciate it. So I just want to um, echo Dr. Kelly's welcome to you. Uh, to come to join us in person, those of you who are able to, and for those of you who didn't, uh, we think we've set this up where you'll get as much benefit, almost as much benefit of those people who are here uh, with us in person. Uh, the theme of this forum uh, is two decades of excellence, nurturing future leaders in STEM. And I think that's more than appropriate. And when we talk about future leaders in STEM, we're talking about you. And I think this program, as you'll hear and discover, has a track record of producing great leaders in STEM at NOAA and in other places. But I want to start by thanking NOAA Administrator Dr. Richard Spinrad, who's going to you're going to hear from later uh, in this opening session, uh, the Director of uh, Education, uh, Ms. Louisa Koch, who's here with us on the podium. She's going to speak as well. But I also want to acknowledge in their absence, uh, Ms. Jacqueline Rousseau, the Director of the Education and Partnership Program with NOAA, Dr. Audrey Trotman, who is um, uh, with us virtually as well, and Dr. White, who's here with us this morning in person. Uh, it took a lot of people to pull this off. And by the way, this is phase two of this forum. And so we have now the distinct honor of having the longest lasting education and science forum in Noah's history, right? Stressed out over two wonderful years. But it took a great amount of work to, to pull this together. First of all, there's a center-wise uh, organ organizing organization committee and team. And I wanna thank all of the center directors from the other centers for stepping up and serving in those roles as well as those key individuals from your centers as well. There is an internal uh, FAMU team that did a lot of what you see here uh, to make this possible on our campus. And I want to give them a huge shout out for the work that they have done and will continue to do to make your visit here uh, as beneficial as possible. This 20 years of this program has been a, an amazing journey. I've had the privilege of being here in one way or the other, all of those 20 years. And uh, I can't tell you how grateful I am to have witnessed the transformation that this program has caused in many places within NOAA and outside of the agency as well when it comes to tapping into uh, the talent resident in historical black colleges and minority serving institutions around this nation, finding young men and women like yourselves who will go on and make a huge difference in the work that NOAA does and in similar agencies and industries around the nation. It's been a wonderful journey. Another person who's with us today, who's been there all along all the way, where well, is, uh, you know, Ms. Louisa Cope. She's been there from the beginning. Um, uh, and Louisa, I want to thank you for that and, and all of those other people, and Ms. Rousseau in particular, who shepherded and guarded this program like it was a child to make sure that it stayed protected over these last 20 years. There's nothing like it anywhere. Since you're at Florida M University, I, I have to um, take a moment just to tell you a little bit about uh, this place. It's a very special place. Uh, we just celebrated in the October of last year, 134 years of providing exceptional education experiences for our students. Uh, this, by the way, uh, it was a form, is a former slave plantation, right? And now on this site, 134 years later, 
you have the highest ranked public HBCU in the nation, something we're really, really proud of. You know, our story at FAMU is one of perseverance, uh, resilience, grit, courage, struggle, hope, love, and charity. And in the end, as our current model suggests, uh, excellence with caring is something that we take very seriously here. So we want to welcome you all here to this campus. COVID couldn't stop us. The weather that we had yesterday couldn't stop us. Nothing's going to stop any of us from doing the great things that we have to do to protect our communities and, and this nation as a whole. And by the way, regarding COVID, those of you who might be interested, you know, right down the street, literally, we have a uh, COVID-19 testing site and vaccination site. That site is the first community-based site in this region of Florida to offer testing to people without physician referral. And as of this week, we celebrate having administered over 628,000 tests at that site. And you're welcome to go there. We have PCR as well as rapid testing. If you feel a little bit under the weather and not quite so sure, you can go and find out and you'll probably get your results back in less than an hour. And those of you who are interested in getting vaccinated, we have all three vaccines available at this site since February of last year, having vaccinated nearly 25,000 people uh, at that site. So we want to con well, continue to be a, a, a you know, a, a force in this community offering opportunities not only for students, but also helping our community strive. And that's why we work so hard to get that site here on our campus and we plan to continue operating it until the all clear is given regarding COVID-19. But in the meantime, we are here. You know, we've gone through some tough struggles. Uh, as much as I enjoyed the phase one virtual component of this, I'm looking forward to this in-person version much more. We actually kicked it off last night, right? For those of you who had an opportunity to come for those for rapid fire sessions with NOAA mentors, uh, there were quite a number of students here in the, in the facility uh, to enjoy that. And I think that was just the start. Just a little bit of um, uh, you know, directional information. The, uh, the technical sessions are gonna be held upstairs on the fourth floor. The elevators on both sides of the arena, uh, to my left and to my right, you go up to the fourth floor, either you can walk around to the, the four uh, technical session rooms that have been fit with technology to make this possible, not only for you to uh, hear and engage, but also those persons who are going to be participating online. So we really, really worked hard to, to make this possible. We want you to enjoy every single minute of it we feel so honored to have you here on the campus of Florida a &M University. Thank you. Good morning. It is an honor to introduce you to the Undersecretary of Commerce for Oceans and Atmospheres and the 11th Administrator of the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. Dr. Richard Spinrad. Dr. Spinrad is responsible for the strategic direction and oversight of NOAA's more than 12,000 employees. Under his leadership, NOAA's portfolio of products and services to address the climate crisis, to enhance environmental sustainability, and to foster economic development are being developed. Dr. Spinrad is also committed to working across NOAA to create a more just, equitable, diverse, and inclusive NOAA workforce. Dr. Spinrad's relationship with NOAA has been longstanding and has, he's led, as he's led NOAA's Office of Oceanic and Atmospheric Research and the National o Ocean Service from 2003 to 2010. He also served as NOAA's chief scientist under, the Barack Obama, under President Barack Obama in 2000, um, from 2014 to 2016. His accolades and accomplishments are longstanding and impressive, and we're pleased that he's able to join us today for, um, to share comments regarding the 10th iteration of the NOAA Education and Science Forum. So without further ado, I present to some and introduce to others, Dr. Richard Spinrad. 
Thank you. And thank you so much for that very kind introduction. Let me take this opportunity also to thank Dr. Robinson for his remarks. Uh, I had the pleasure of working with Dr. Robinson for a short amount of time uh, when he was with us at NOAA uh, several years back. Larry, it's great to see you again. You haven't changed a bit. You are as eloquent, elegant, and distinguished as always. Great to see you. I also regret that I'm not able to join you today in Florida as I'm with 10,000 of my closest friends at the National Space Symposium in Colorado Springs. I can tell you that outside my window are the Rocky Mountains, gorgeous and breathtaking, but I assure you nowhere near as inspiring as the audience that you have there in Tallahassee. I'll also tell you that I'm delighted that you've got Louisa Cope there with you. Louisa is one of our strongest leaders at NOAA, and so uh, recognize that you've got the strength of NOAA leadership joining you there today. And let me congratulate you on the 10th Biennial Forum. Um, I'm excited that you're able to have this meeting in person uh, and to share some of the amazing work that's going on at the Cooperative Science Centers. I recently visited the NOAA Center for Earth System Sciences and Remote Sensing Technology, CESER, at City College of New York. And I had the chance to see some of the great work being done by the NOAA EPP MSI program. I had a terrific time at the event. Uh, we probably spent about three hours there. And in fact, I had so much fun walking through. Uh, the organizers had done a terrific job, first of having a roundtable discussion uh, with faculty, and then I had the opportunity to visit with students and uh, see uh, there were about a dozen posters being presented. Uh, we had a, a slide, I don't know if we're able to put it up on the screen. Uh, it just shows uh, me engaging with a number of the students. And what really impressed me, I'm not surprised, as you've heard in the intro, I've worked at NOAA on and off. This is actually my fourth job at NOAA many years, and I've had the opportunity to see the uh, quality of uh, products and output that students and faculty engaged in the CSE programs. What really impressed me with those particular presentations, and I see you've got the slide up now, was obviously the quality of the work, but also the relevance to the NOAA mission. Every single one of the uh, presentations, the posters, uh, that I had the chance to um, study and hear about. And it was every one. I want to make sure folks know. Uh, I actually, we ended up closing up the place. <laughs> they were pulling the posters down as we were walking through. It, uh, it was getting to be such a late hour. But every one of those posters talked to a critical issue uh, at NOAA, whether it's climate or fisheries or coastal restoration or weather forecasting. Obviously, at the, at the uh, CCNY, uh, CC at Cesar, there was a lot of focus on remote sensing capabilities, um, a topic which is near and dear to my heart, and one for which I think we really need to make sure that the next generation, the people that will be coming into NOAA in the near future, are using state-of-the-art capability and really understand the mission priorities uh, at NOAA. So, you know, I've got to say that the impact of the NOAA investment in student research really was undeniable. And students told me that the support and the collaboration that they've got with the NOAA mentors really changed their lives. And I, I don't use that phrase lightly. There were a number of very compelling, uh, heartwarming stories about the relationships that students had with the, their NOAA mentors and with faculty. I suspect this is the case for almost all of the EPP MSI student participants. And I hope during my tenure as the NOAA administrator uh, that I get a chance to visit all of the CSCs. I am committed to doing that. I'm making that committed commitment public here, so help me make it possible. I hope you all know that the EPP MSI program is NOAA's largest investment in post-secondary education and future workforce development. Literally thousands, I believe the number is close to 3,200 students have gone through the program over the last 20 years. EPP MSI supported students who are trained by faculty, mentored by uh, NOAA staff, and earn degrees in disciplines that are aligned with our mission at NOAA. And they are uh, on the track to become competitive candidates for the future NOAA and NOAA mission enterprise workforce. The CSCs have supported actually uh, more than 3,200 students 
and 84 of those alumni are currently employed at NOAA. While I'm happy to have the current alumni as part of our NOAA family, I'd love to see us increase that percentage. NOAA is an exciting place to work. We are the nation's authoritative source in the federal government, climate products and services. This is an important responsibility, especially now as we look around and see what's happening and how climate change is impacting our lives and our livelihoods. We're taking great strides to integrate equity into everything we do, including how we build and provide services, which means co-development of products. And within NOAA, we're working to promote diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility in the workforce. Uh, I'm uh, proud to point out that on the political team that I've been able to construct as NOAA administrator, uh, over 80% of those who come in are women and over 50% are people of color. Externally, will provide equitable access to our products and services. We just released our 2021 science report, the report that I actually started when I was the chief scientist five years ago. And it gives great insight into NOAA's research accomplishments and priorities. Take time to look online, you can pull it up, uh, and help us find a better path forward. You'll get a really good sense of the diversity of scientific issues that we're addressing. We'd like to see more of the students who are trained and supported by this program join the NOAA workforce and help us accomplish our critical and exciting mission. We seek young minds with diverse perspectives to provide innovative solutions to the issues that we address as an agency. And the students being supported by the EPP MSI program are poised to meet that need, as I just demonstrated in the examples from CCNY. The specialized training in mission critical areas is what makes that such an effective program in areas as diverse as meteorology, sustainable fisheries, artificial intelligence, and many more. Our partnership with MSIs has increased the capacity for education and research, and it's broadened participation of communities who've been historically underrepresented in STEM, in natural resource management, and policies that align with our mission. We are committed to supporting at NOAA the Biden administration's whole of government approach to address external service barriers and ensure equity in everything we do in order to address the needs of vulnerable communities. We've also made environmental justice a priority and we're looking forward to increasing engagement with the EPP MSI Cooperative Science Centers to establish collaborative approaches to environmental justice challenges within local communities. In fact, my senior advisor for equity We'll conduct a session today entitled Environmental Justice and Equity at NOAA. Uh, I think you'll really appreciate that and get a chance to learn what the way forward looks like. And within the academic community, we're going to highlight the agency's efforts in EJ and engage the CSC community in ways that you all can help contribute to this space. So I thank the EPP MSI program and the Center for Coastal and Marine Ecosystems for the opportunity to speak here today. I'm going to uh, stick around as long as I can. My handlers have me leaving at the top of the hour, but um, I, I do want to hear what Luisa has got to say, and I want to uh, be able to spend as much time as I can with you and uh, uh, answer some questions and engage in dialogue. So thank you very much for this opportunity, and I look forward to seeing you all in person in the not too distant future. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Spinrad. Our next speaker, and I have to get this right because she's my boss, <laughs> is Ms. Louisa Koch, NOAA's Director of Education. Ms. Koch has more than 20 years of experience with NOAA. As Director of Education, she oversees the K through 12, as well as higher education programs, including the Educational Partnership Program with minority serving institutions within the Office of Education. She also leads the NOAA Education Council, which is more or less a think, think tank, where, um, which is composed of educators across NOAA who work collectively to provide the most productive education products for the, um, for the public at large. Needless to say, Ms. Koch is passionate about education, and she's committed to the success of the EPP MSI program and wants to see the students supported by this program gain relevant internship and other experiential opportunities at NOAA with hopes that they will someday join our workforce. Please help me welcome Ms. Louisa Koch.
Thank you, Natasha. Um, Natasha is a FAMU alum, so um, uh, it's wonderful to have her back here um, uh, today. And, and, and she's done a lot to make FAMU shine within NOAA. Um, I want to thank Dr. Robinson uh, for his dedicated efforts to the Educational Partnership Program with Minority Serving Institutions, or EPP MSI, for more than 20 years. Um, uh, his leadership really helped define the vision for this program and guide it. Um, and he has helped enable it to become the incredible force uh, that, that it is today. I also want to thank Florida a and University for hosting our event. Um, thanks for the planning team. They have been working for three and a half years to get us here today. Um, we finally made it. You guys are going to be relieved of duty here in a couple more days. So um, thank you for your efforts. And, and there actually will be an end to this forum. And as Dr. Robinson said, this is the longest forum that NOAA has ever hosted. Um, so um, I do want to thank Jacqueline Rousseau, um, the director of the EPP MSI program, and Natasha White, who led on the NOAA effort um, here. I want to thank all the students and the faculty and the staff and the NOAA employees for coming here today. Um, you know, we're all sort of breaking out of that Corona shell. Um, and uh, for some of this, for some of us, this is more of an adventure than others, but we're here today and so happy to be here. We are here today to celebrate 20 years of EPP MSI, this strong partnership between NOAA and the Cooperative Science Centers and the hard work and the um, outstanding performance that has resulted from it. It is really an impressive engagement. NOAA is delighted with the STEM leadership that have come out of the centers and we will continue to empower the, those people and help them achieve new heights. So what has the EPP MSI program accomplished over the last 20 years? A lot. Since 2001, the program has supported more than 4,000 students. More than half of those students have been awarded bachelor's, master's, and PhD degrees. These degrees have made a major impact on NOAA and the nation. Since 2003, EPP MSI has supported more than half of the African American PhDs in atmospheric science. More than a third of the African Americans and Hispanic students earning PhDs in marine science and almost a third of the African Americans earning PhDs in environmental science. This program is changing the nation for the better. To achieve those results, thousands of classes were taken and more classes need to be taken for those of you that are students here. Thousands of exams were passed. You need to keep passing those exams. Years of research were completed. Thousands of degrees were earned and thousands of careers were launched. I would like to acknowledge the dedicated faculty and staff who gave, taught those classes and gave those exams and mentored those students for all of your efforts. I would also like to acknowledge the EPP MSI undergraduate scholars. Since 2001, NOAA has supported students from minority serving institutions across the country as they build their professional skills and explore career opportunities. For all of the EPP MSI students, attaining a degree is the beginning of your adventure. Those degrees open up many opportunities. Students who major in STEM, who get degrees in STEM, make more money than students that get non-STEM degrees, whether you work in STEM fields or not. About half of EPP, EPP students go on to work in the private sector, and this includes many companies that work with NOAA to accomplish our mission. About a quarter of alumni go to work in academia, which we love to see because that grows capacity for um, STEM-related majors in the future. And about a quarter of the students come to work in government, which is also a wonderful outcome. We would like to increase the number of students coming to NOAA. And as a way um, of, of working towards that goal, for the last five years, we have increased the connection between NOAA and the students um, in order to help build the future workforce. All EPP MSI graduate students are required to spend at least 12 weeks working at NOAA. And starting next year, 
we're looking forward to un more undergraduate EPP students also doing NOAA internships. 190 graduate students have completed their internships, known as NOAA Experiential Research and Training Opportunities, or NIRTOs. During the NIRTOs, students work on projects that are of interest to themselves, to their academic advisors, and also to their NOAA mentors. These training opportunities can lead to jobs. If you're interested in working for NOAA, look for an opportunity that may lead to job. It is okay to ask about future job opportunities related to a NERDO. There are more than 80 EPP MSI alums working at NOAA today and 18 were hired in the last three years. We now have direct hiring authority and with these NIRTOs, we have a better connection to students. And so we're seeing the numbers tick up and we're very pleased about that. I would like to um, have all of the NOAA people that are in the room stand up because these people are, um, are important connections for you to the agency. If there is a person standing that you did not recognize, um, please reach out to them. Um, would all the EPP MSI um, uh, supported students that are now working at NOAA stand up? Apologize for making you stand up. So these are the people that have walked the walk and have made the journey and have, and have arrived in NOAA and they can help you figure out the next steps in your career. These people are great role models and great resources. They can help you understand what NOAA does and why we do it. They can help you explore the research opportunities that are interested interest you and help you find other people at NOAA that can be more precise in, in making that connection. Please seek them out and talk to them. They are here to help you. We are all here to help you. I hope these NOAA folks make a lot of new friends um, and I'm counting on those of you who are not those people to, uh, to, to, to be reaching out. Before I finish here today, I want to um, uh, encourage the graduate students here to consider applying for the EPP MSI graduate fellowships. Applications are open now, so you can go and talk to your center director um, about uh, what that might mean. Successful students um, will spend a year working at NOAA, um, using NOAA equipment, working with NOAA scientists on a NOAA-related uh, project. Um, are Chanel Houghton and Harold Gamaro here? I'm not seeing them. Um, those are our two current fellows. If you know them um, or wanna reach out to them, please talk to your center director. I'm sure that they would be happy to speak to you. Um, NOAA is committed to making EPP MSI um, uh, and the success of the centers um, uh, more broadly. Uh, we wanna to continue to support that. And I am looking forward to um, hearing a lot of great presentations um, from the students. I like to see the posters showing up on the walls uh, and looking forward to many days of good discussions and many more years of success for the program. Um, and, and, and please think about asking questions because there's a Q&A session coming up. So, so be thinking now about what question you might wanna ask. I know Dr. Spinrad can't stay that much longer, but if you have a question for him, um, we might be good starting with those. Thank you very much. Okay, any questions in the room for Dr. Robinson, Dr. Spinrad, or Ms. Koch? We do have one question that came in online. Um, that question reads, NOAA has spent a lot of money training students through the EPP MSI programs. Has NOAA set a target number or percent of graduates to hire from this program what does success look like? It looks like that question was directed at Dr. Spinrad, so we can get him back on the screen. Good, yeah, thank you for that question. The short answer is there's no target. He's, not, he's uh, mute, you're muted, Dr. Spinrad. Hmm. <laughs> hey, let's try again. I'm not muted at my end. Can you hear me now? Yes. Very good, okay. So the short answer is there's no quota per se. Uh, what we're trying to do is make sure that 
NOAA is uh, representative of the American public that we serve. And so in terms of the demographics and distribution uh, and diversity of the agency, um, my goal would be that it is as diverse and uh, well represented, well represented uh, as the full American public. So clearly we're not there yet. Uh, and I would argue that simply saying, well, in time, you know, over the next generation, that'll be resolved is not a good enough answer. So one of the uh, value, we have several valuable tools, things like direct hire authority, and we've hardwired uh, many of those tools uh, into programs like EPP MSI. And so my real question is, how can we be a little bit more aggressive in using those tools uh, to increase the numbers? Thank you. Any questions in the room? I have another question um, and I'll invite you to answer this, Louisa. So in addition to academic qualifications, what are favorable criteria that students should possess that will make them attractive candidates for careers at NOAA? Um, so yes, academic performance is very important, but having that, that, that um, substantive connection, um, uh, having students be interested in a topic that's important to NOAA, knowing people is also really important, which is why getting to know those NOAA people can really be helpful. A lot of times opportunities pop up and um, if you're in the right place at the right time, you can make a connection that can lead to a job. Um, if you don't have those connections, uh, you, won't, you won't be able to make those um, opportunities happen. So um, the academics are important, but the, the, the academic focus um, and those personal connections are so important. Absolutely. Questions in the room? I see one hand, yes. The question was, in, in anyone's career development, what inspired them to want to work at NOAA? Is that my understanding of the question? It's hard to hear you. So I'll just, I'll give my experience. So I was um, a, a student here at Florida Agricultural and Mechanical University. As a graduate student, I was introduced to NOAA through Dr. Robinson um, and the then Environmental Cooperative Science Center Award. During my graduate program, I had the opportunity to be afforded a fellowship through the EPPMSI program, which gave me the opportunity con to conduct research at NOAA. Through that opportunity, I really fell in love with the agency and decided to um, have my career be there. So for me, it was a situational opportunity. It's where I was and it's where NOAA was. I didn't honestly know much about NOAA prior to being introduced to it through that program. And so it wasn't something I kind of sought out. It kind of, it was, it, I was in the right place at the right time. But, you know, as, as I've met students over the years who truly have a desire to work at NOAA, this program has really been a good springboard to help them to get to the career they want because of the, the networking and the camaraderie among the cohorts and the, just the, the opportunities to do internships and meet new people have led to career opportunities. So the experience is really going to be what you make it um, and the opportunities are there for you to capture. You're welcome. I have one final question and there you go. Can't hear you. Uh, the program and the benefits of having a student uh, come and work at NOAA. Um, I'm just wondering, is there a national effort happening or is that only at the center level? 
And if it isn't, I think it would be a great idea to happen at the national level. So the, the EPP MSI program occurs at a national level, essentially, because the centers are located across the country, mostly concentrated on the East Coast, but then, you know, just like NOAA, there's, there's a presence on the West Coast. We're doing work now to get the word out throughout NOAA about these centers and about the types of students that, we're, that are being trained and supported by EPP MSI. And it takes people like you, honestly, to, Latrice, to help us get the word out more. Um, we do have a, a dedicated few that work well with the EPP MSI program, and they're always, you know, collaborating with us and wanting to work more with the centers. So it's an ongoing effort by EPP MSI in collaboration with each of the line offices to get the word out throughout NOAA about the centers. And we're also, you know, working with the centers to um, get the word out about them and their communities. These, um, most of the centers are located in communities like, for instance, FAMU is located in um, predominantly underrepresented um, communities. So we want to see more work from the centers going to the communities. So there, there are efforts to, to get the word out more in that regard. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, final question. And this question is for um, either Dr. Robinson or Dr. Spinrad. After 20 years of successful partnership between NOAA and the Cooperative Science Centers, what do you think both parties can do to take the partnership to the next level? And I'll invite Dr. Robinson since he's... Well, well thank you, uh, Dr. White, for that question. Um, I think, first of all, just to follow up on the last question, one of the things built into the program by NOAA is something we call technical monitors, right? And we have two for the Center for Coastal Marine Ecosystem. I see Steve over there. I saw Chris last night. Those are the people who are sort of the internal ambassadors working with the line offices and programs to help us find opportunities for our students and our faculty. They work very effectively on our behalf. And then at a higher level, it was formed just a few years ago, well, maybe five, the Champions Group, right, where NOAA senior leadership and the corporate science center leadership get together to talk about strategies to increase the visibility of this program across NOAA. And then finally, we have you, right? I mean, that's why NOAA is so concerned, EPP that is, about you giving proper attribution on your posters and papers and your manuscripts about who funded your work, right? Getting the word out about this program. And then to this question um, uh, that I was just asked, I'll go back uh, 20 years when we had our first center directors meeting, Lisa, you were there. And, and it's something I, I've stressed for years that, you know, there were two parts to this response. One is I said that if Noah was able to hire every student that these four corporative science centers graduated, then the four corporative science centers would have failed, which meant that we hadn't produced enough students, right? We should have produced so many students with a level of investment that NOAA couldn't possibly hire them all. You know, we had to send some into academia, into the private sector, into the other federal agencies. However, I said that if NOAA didn't not only hire you know, its fair share of these students is going to be hard for us to come back to our institutions and articulate to our students successfully that there were career opportunities at NOAA. They didn't just need to hire them, they needed to be seen in high places like the uh, young lady who just left the podium, Dr. White, so that they could be role models for these students who are aspiring to get to NOAA. Okay, thing number one. Uh, thing number two is, is that this program was conceived with the idea that by no investing or establishing these centers at HBCUs and MSIs, right, it made a whole lot of sense because guess where the bulk of scientists from these demographics are coming from, right? HBCUs and MSIs. However, uh, it had to be something more than what we had typically done. That is where we funded a program two or three years and expected to really move the needle on underrepresentation in STEM discipline. In this particular case, STEM disciplines related to NOAA. You know, I feel very good now that 20 years later, that message has been received and acted upon by NOAA. Not only have they made a long sustained investment 
in our institutions in these programs, they have made substantial investments as well. One of the things that we have the luxury of, and I put that in quotes, is that we always argue that in many cases, centers of these types at NOAA and other places then re recompete every three or five years. There was an opportunity for them to have, depending upon, depending upon positive uh, outcomes during that time frame, the opportunity to be, quote, renewed based upon some type of review. And I'm really pleased that NOAA included that opportunity in the FFO, the federal funding opportunity uh, that went out in 2016. And we were really pleased to be um, able to now um, continue for another five years. However, after going through a very rigorous review process. So a sustained investment, a substantial investment is critical for these programs moving forward. And, you know, I think as much as we can always tweak and get better, right, we really need to avoid the temptation. Another thing I've seen at the federal sector that really is different in this program Noah listened to us. This program was founded with the input of eight or 10 HBCUs in the beginning. And we were so proud that we can brag about them listening to us and putting the program together with our input. And then of course we had to go and compete like everybody else, but that's fine. And as long as we continue that type of uh, model, and by the way, these are not grants. And, and I really appreciate that they aren't. These are cooperative agreements, which demand a much closer integrated collaboration with the funding agent, agency NOAA, but ultimately they are the boss. There are some things that we have to do to continue this collaboration. But I did really appreciate that up close and personal component, but NOAA's commitment to this for the long term is what's gonna make a difference. We need to not fix what's broke. We can always get better, but this program has made a tremendous impact. And if we continue the path of the last 20 years, God only knows where we'll be at the 40th anniversary of this program. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Robinson. So it looks like we're um, at the end of the opening plenary session. The next session is the student challenge session, which will welcome um, Dr. John Cortinez to the stage to um, issue that challenge and talk about the issue at hand. Dr. Kelly is going to officially introduce Dr. Cortinas as he walks to the stage. <laughs> 